this uh, chapter on corporate uh, bonds is primarily to understand what are the various kinds of bonds that are there what are the various uh, cash flows that are associated with a bond and uh, probably what are the various mechanisms that are available if i want to close the bond or call back the bond redeem the bond so that's the total flow that is being talked about in this so just as a uh, a quick start into this uh, chapter every bond has what is called as an indenture indenture is more like a prospectus right probably uh, uh, the, the full fledged details about everything about the bond which will contain probably what uh, see bond is like a borrowing i am issuing a bond is like i am borrowing something so what are the obligations of the borrower when how much he will pay at what point in time so all these things are captured as a part of indenture and apart from that even the indenture will also talk about kind of do's and don'ts of the borrower probably he should not borrow even more without our notice or probably he should not give a dividend of more than this much amount the company should not give more than a dividend of this much amount without the permission of the bond holders so these kind of do's and don'ts also are mentioned as a part of indenture so apart from that okay how much will be paid at what point in time and if at all the company defaults in terms of payment what would be done any collaterals all these kind of details including can the company call back the bond in the middle or will it go until maturity period can the company buy back the bond somewhere in the middle itself without uh, taking it until the maturity all these kind of things are mentioned at the time of issuing of the bond itself not in the middle whatever it's like a prospectus whatever is written in the bond indenture only those things can i mean the, it's mandatory for the issuer to stick to those things right and to make sure that the bond is bond will fulfill its obligations a trustee is maintained for every issue for every bond issue a trustee is what is coming into picture it's a third party to the contract not a member of the company or something not a ceo of the company it's a third party which is having a lot of uh, reputation who is having a lot of uh, reputation with respect to acting in these kind of roles main intention is authenticating or probably giving a kind of uh, assurance that the company will pay the interest as well as principal on time because it's like a borrowing the company will pay the interest and the principal and even the trustee has uh, a kind of uh, responsibility to ensure that whatever the obligations that are shown in the indenture whatever the do's and don'ts that are mentioned in the indenture they are all adhered by the issuer so generally this role is uh, performed by a bank or some kind of a trust who have a lot of expertise in trustee function and one more key aspect with respect to bonds is earlier retirement is very much possible early retirement is call back the bond before the maturity date itself this is very much possible but it has to be mentioned in the indenture right though the bond initially it has been issued for a 10 year period the maturity period being 10 years if the company wants to scrap the bonds after 5 years or the better word to use is either redeem the bonds or probably retire the bonds or call back the bond all are the same similar kind of name so the company wants to retire the bond let's say within 5 years not until 10 years then that is what we call as a call back provision on the bond and 
if the company wants to exercise that kind of a provision, it's again a call option. Right? If you want, you can buy back your bond. Otherwise, you need not buy back. Looking more similar to a call option. If you want, you can buy the share in future. Otherwise, don't buy. Similarly, here saying, if you want, you buy back your bond. Otherwise, don't buy back. So, more or less, it's a replica of call option. That's where we call it as callback. Callback or sometimes we call it as callable bond. Callable is nothing but uh, call option is present on that particular bond. Whereas when we say puttable bond, if you want, you can sell it. This feature will be available to the investor. If you want to sell off your bond back to the company, you sell it. Otherwise, you keep it until maturity. But when I say callable bond, if the in issuer or if the company wants to buy back the bond, it can do it. Otherwise, it will not. So, whether there is an early retirement provision that is available, which is like one, some, one, something like a callability. And we will also talk about a few more early retirement options. So, if at all these kind of options are available, they have to be mentioned in the indenture itself. And even the maturity date, which is nothing but the date, until that particular date, the interest will continue. The interest will continue until that date and principal payment should be over by that date. That is what we are calling as a maturity date. And how do we see from the bond standpoint, we are seeing almost every kind of entity can typically issue a bond. Either there are some infrastructure kind of bonds, public utilities kind of bonds. See a water department will issue a bond. Uh, 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 you know, probably a, a power department will issue a bonds, right? These are all some public utilities departments issuing the bonds and where the borrowed money is utilized for those public utilities investments, right? Roads and uh, buildings, they can issue bonds for the improvement of the roads. They are all public utility specific bonds. Sometimes you have a transportation kind of bonds, especially in US, we find these kind of various categories, industrial bonds which are more for uh, probably a typical growth, right? An LNT may, may issue a bond typically for the growth of its business. These kind of bonds are typically categorized to industrial or sometimes a bank and finance companies, probably a Muthut Finance can come out with uh, a bond issue which will uh, finance its expansion plan. Or like that, every bank can come out or uh, so the, the various entities are probably here we see a lot of infrastructure bonds, right? Whatever uh, the, the capital that is raised, it is put in the infrastructure industry. So all these things are going into the category of corporate bond. Now, some of the things, specific things associated with a bond. One major thing that comes out is coupon. Some key characteristics if we are looking at the bond, one main characteristic is coupon, which is like a regular payment, right? Instead of paying everything at uh, maturity, we are talking about some periodic payment, which we have already seen uh, earlier. Either it could be a fixed rate coupon or a floating rate coupon. So, or it could be a zero coupon, right? In, in case of swaps, we have looked at uh, a lot of these aspects. There is a fixing, fixed rate payment or a floating rate payment. So, coupon is also like a periodic payment that happens on a bond at regular intervals. It has nothing to do with the market interest rate. It's a characteristic of a bond. It's not a characteristic of the market. The bond may pay more interest than what the market rate is or less interest than what the market rate is or it may not pay anything which becomes a zero coupon bond. Right? So, in, the, in case of zero coupon bonds, we are talking of no intermediate payments, right? This is what is the funda we have used for arriving at our spot rates also. Zero coupon bonds, which are not delivered anything in the middle and everything on the face value on the maturity. So, they are always issued at a discount to the face value because face value is what is paid on maturity and nothing is paid intermediate. So, they have to be issued at a much cheaper rate to the face value 
to make sure that you are giving the face value at maturity probably which will add up to either 5% or 8% or 10% kind of a return between this period. So the present let's say if you are uh, giving a uh, thousand is the face value after five years. So today it has to be issued at e power rp. Whatever is the r, right? If I am assuming that uh, the r is 10%, e power 0.5 is what is the minimum issue rate at this moment. So probably at 800, 700, whatever is the amount. Only then it will amount to 1000 after five years with probably 10% uh, kind of an interest rate every year. And uh, yeah, here in case of bankruptcy, what will happen? Let's say you have paid 600 to purchase a bond for a five year period. And the bond says on maturity, it will pay you 1000. Today you pay 600. On maturity, the bond will pay you 1000. Now let's say the company defaulted within two years. It became bankrupt. Within two years, the company has gone bankrupt. Then what is the claim for the person who has purchased the bond? It will not be 1000. Because 1000 will come only after five years. But the company has defaulted within two years. So, if at all the claim has to come for this person, it would be only to the extent of the accrued interest for the two year period. Whatever semi annual compounding or continuous compounding, whatever is the compounding mechanism, right? Whatever is the interest rate, accrued interest, because in case of zero coupon bonds, the interest is only accrued. Let's say. You have taken an FD for 5 years. You have paid 600. But the FD says you will get 1000 after 5 years. But after 2 years the bank got closed. How much you should get? You should not get 1000. You should get only the 2 years interest rate on 600. Because that is your accrued interest for the 2 year period. So probably 750 or something. Whatever is the amount that... Uh, works out for the interest rate for the two years that is what you would be receiving so even a coupon bond can be very well converted into so many zero coupon bonds we have already talked about strips converting a coupon bond into a zero coupon uh, bonds where interest rates are coupons are treated uh, as separate zero coupon bond and the principal is treated as a separate zero coupon bond and each one is traded separately, which is what was the base for computing your pot rates. Right? So, any coupon bond, I can very well translate into multiple number of zero coupon bonds. And, now, different types of bonds here we are going to look at. Some of them are mortgage bonds, wherein, Probably, we will just have the look at the names, we will discuss them. Mortgage bonds are most common kind of bonds. We have equipment trust certificates. We have a debenture bonds or debentures. These are different kinds of bonds that could be issued in the market. Either by utilities department or uh, infrastructure department or whatever may be the department. They can issue any of these bonds. Now, when we say mortgage bond, it's nothing but... See, whatever the capital that is raised, bond, you look at it as the capital that is being raised, right? Okay, someone has issued a bond, which means they have raised capital. Someone have bought the bonds. Someone has bought the bonds. Bought the bonds means this entity, probably who has issued the bonds, they got money now. Capital is what they have got. What they do is, they will use this capital to give loans, housing loans. They use this capital either directly or through a bank. They use this capital to give some housing loan. Right? Now, 
the people who have taken housing loans they have to pay back the emis some principal some interest they have to pay back the emis and what typically happens is depending on the payment that comes on the emis it would be paid as interest to the bond investors right i mean the logic works like this if i am raising a mortgage i am issuing mortgage bond the intention is i'll raise capital first from the public that capital which i have raised i am giving so many housing loans which is they are the mortgages mortgages are nothing but the housing loans are those kind of loans is what i am giving and those loans are i mean when i give a housing loan the typical even in a current bank scenario we'll see when a bank gives us a housing loan the house will be in the name of the bank until you pay back the loan so the asset is acting as a collateral for the loans which this party is giving so in case the various people who have taken the loans they are not able to pay back their emi the houses will go to the possession of those people they can either sell the house they can use the house whatever it is but they will go as a possession to the bond investors these kind of bonds are being called as mortgage bonds right so someone can very well issue a mortgage bond where the capital that is raised is purely used to issue mortgages for lending for house loan sectors right so the backing is real estate properties houses or proper lands or whatever it is they are the typical backing and in case the people default on the emi again this party who has raised the capital he will default to the other party but because there is a, a property that is being acting as a collateral the investors in the bond will not have too much of an issue as long as the property value is good enough but the moment you see the property value slashing for the investors it's a big loss that is what has one of the probably one of the starting points for your subprime crisis right though this is the kind of scenario that was existing but uh, the typical scenario was the loans were given primarily to probably unqualified kind of people or very very risky people who could not pay back and those defaults rising in i mean one of the major issues of course there is even more a bigger chain inside but to cut the story short this this typical scenario is one of the major things that has resulted in the crisis altogether because the inability to pay is the starting point of the chain and uh, the 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 collaterals which were the properties that were used their value has gone down drastically in the market which again is creating a loss to the bond investors even see if if uh, if uh, a very traditional government equivalent kind of a bond defaults then it has a very huge repercussions in the market right we are assuming that it is risk free but it is becoming more and more risky and defaulting that is what is a scenario of a crisis getting exploded altogether and most of the companies which have issued these kind of bonds they are all having very high credit ratings and those high credit rated companies itself defaulted which is what was the cause for the entire crisis but in normal scenarios what we are saying is because the they are backed by the properties so even uh, when uh, one party is defaulting it should not be a big issue but in this case so because they are very less risky kind of scenarios because you have a property to back up the returns on these bonds right which the buyers will get here the returns will be much much lesser compared to any other because they are almost treated as risk free one they are issued by very high trustworthy companies right two there is a very good collateral backing it 
because of these two things they are treated as very low risky kind of companies low risky kind of companies means low returns is what they typically offer but in this one of the major drawbacks which i typically see the major risk is with respect to reinvestment risk or prepayment risk there is a possibility that these guys do a early repayment of the loan very much possible right uh, if uh, if uh, the borrowers a loan borrowers house loan takers if they do a early repayment of the loan right what we will observe even at a later point also is the simple reason why any finance aware investor will repay a loan is there are no other better opportunities to invest the money i mean simple logic let's say okay it's it's like this let's say i have to pay an interest rate of 8% to my bank in the form of emi what i am saying is if at all i am able to invest my money which can give me 10% return every year i'll invest 10% here pay 8% to my bank 2% is my extra benefit that's the strategy of any finance aware kind of an investor only if he is able to invest at 6% but he has to pay to the bank at 8% only in those scenarios he will think of paying back the loan which means the market interest rates have gone down so drastically that you cannot get an investment return more than 6% or 7% whereas you have to pay 8% to your bank if you are continuing your loan it is in those cases the person will seriously think why not repay the whole loan whatever the excess money we have let's repay it back so there what is happening for the bank or whoever it is they are facing the reinvestment risk what do what to do with the money which came in early even if they invest they get lesser rates of return even now they cannot give the loans also at a higher rate so for them it's a serious risk now think of the people who have invested there What, uh, what did we say here? Whatever the money that is coming in the form of interest and principal, that is paid back to the bond investor. Now, if a lump sum prepayments come, even you are repaying your bond investors also accordingly. Now they are getting. Now this is the scenario where interest rates have gone down in the market drastically. What will I do if I get the money early? Even I don't have any avenue to invest. this is what is the major risk the mortgage bond is going to suffer assuming collaterals everything are fine one additional risk which will come into scenario is a prepayment if someone makes a prepayment if people make a prepayment of the risk very heavily and that will definitely happen like 1% 2% making a prepayment will occur okay someone will say oh let me get out of all my liabilities let me get rid of all my loans and everything that's 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 the perspective of only one or two people but the regular perspective is there are no other better avenues in the market so let me repay the loan which means uh, even if i invest my money anywhere else i'll not get a better return at all so let me repay the loan that is what is the typical scenario in which this this thing will happen right so if that is the case even uh, these people are getting dumped with a very high amount which they cannot invest anywhere that's a biggest risk that can be occurring with respect to a mortgage bond then we are talking of a debenture kind of a bond which is primarily again it's a bond bond means there is a regular interest payment may or may not be like coupon and principal these are the two major cash flows that are associated with any bond when we say debenture there is no collateral right for for the earlier mortgage bond there is a coupon trust fund 
Okay, I'll, I'll come back to that. Okay, there is uh, one more bond which I missed out here, which is called as an equipment trust certificate. We have I have noted it there, but I did not cover it here. Equipment trust certificate, which is nothing but this is the same kind of a bond like a mortgage bond. But instead of mortgage being acting as a collateral, the equipment acts as a collateral here. Probably a big machine. Right? It's as if I have bought the machine and I have rented it to you. Kind of a leasing. Right? But I will keep the machine under my title until you repay the loan. Until you repay the all the rentals on that machine. I will keep the title with me for that particular equipment. So, but you can use it for your business purpose. Those are the kind of equipment trust certificates that can. So, what is happening for the various bonds the company is raising, for the various capital the company is raising, some por for some portion of the capital, mortgage is being used as collateral. For some portions, Probably the equipments are used as a collateral. So there is only some portion where nothing is used as a collateral. And whichever is not being used as a collateral, whichever is not being used as a collateral, we are calling them as, I mean, uh, we are calling them as debentures. Uh, debentures are issued where there is no collateral at all. Which means, in case of default of a company, Right. In case of a default, a mortgage bond investor will take the houses. The equipment trust uh, investors will take the equipment and sell the in equipment. Whatever is left with the company after all these guys take their take their uh, pieces is what will a debenture holder will take. The investor in a debenture, he will take only those remaining assets that are, only those assets that are remaining in the company after all the secured loan investors have taken their collaterals, whatever is left is being claimed. In case of default, these guys will get the last preference. Uh, see, generally when, when a company defaults, every lender will take out whatever is present within the company. Right? In, in some of the cases, what this investor, what this lender can take is very clearly specified. This lender can take my property in Hyderabad. Right? To the extent of whatever the loan he has to, uh, I mean, whatever the loan I have to pay, he can take that much of property in Hyderabad. So, like that, different people can, or different lenders can have a stake on different kinds of assets that I am holding. So after all these people have been settled, whatever is left with the company, the debenture holders will then come into picture. So they are taking slightly more risk compared to either a mortgage bond investor or an equipment trust certificate investor or any other secured loan kind of investor. So that's the reason because they are taking more risk, they will generally be getting slightly more returns also. The, the interest rates will be slightly higher in case of debentures compared to uh, in case of any other bonds. And this is uh, one more secured kind of a bond where we are talking of guaranteed bond. Like saying, okay, I will have to pay you your interest and principal. But if I don't pay, this company will, this bank will pay or this company will pay. It's just like a surety. You are bringing in some more, uh, some other, uh, 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 some other entity, which is slightly a more reliable kind of, an, let's say a startup wants to take a loan. Generally, because it's a risky company, obviously either the lenders will not come forward to lend it or even if they come forward, they may charge a very high interest rate. But if I say I have a guarantor with me, which is a more established kind of a company. Now what happens? There is a trust that is built in the bonds which I am issuing. Right? I am backed by 
some other guarantor. So in case I fail to pay the interest or the principal, the guarantor will pay on my behalf. So because there is a trust that is getting associated, the risk is directly coming down. Which means I can issue the bonds at a much lesser rate of return also. Those are kind of guarantor kind of bonds. So all these things are very much possible in the bond industry. And of course, all these bonds are also traded in the market also. So they, the prices and all are different at different layers. Now, the next thing that comes is, if I want to call off the bond before the maturity date. As a company, I want to retire the bond before the maturity date itself. What we are talking of is the various provisions that are possible. One is callability, which we have already, I mean, we'll discuss a little bit more, but it's nothing but it's a call option on the bond. If I want to buy back the bond, I can buy it back. Otherwise, I will leave it. That is what we are saying as a call provision on the bond. Then we can also have what is called as a sinking fund provision. We'll come back to it. And we can, we can maintain a separate fund called maintenance and replacement fund. With, with which value will buy back the bonds in the market itself. So, we can have or probably we can have a tender offer. I will discuss uh, each of these things. So, when I am saying call provision, just it allows the issuer. So, it should be there in the prospectus. In the indenture, it should be mandatorily specified whether this bond is callable or not. If it is not, you will call, you will write it as a non-callable bond. Otherwise, you have to mention it as a callable bond. And if it is callable, you have to also mention at what point is it callable. After 5 years after issue, 7 years after issue or between 5 to 7 years any date. Or any date after 5 years. Any of those kind of provisions should be there in the bond. The company can call back the bond either on this date or on these dates or anywhere between this date to this date or any way, any time after this particular date. Any of these kind of things have to be very clearly mentioned as a part of the bond indenture. And when will the company really call back the bond? When will the company buy back the bond? When it when the market price is higher? Right? Generally also, when will I buy a share if I have a call option with me? When will I exercise the call option? If the market price is going above my strike price, I will exercise the call option. So, the same logic if I apply here, if the market price of the bond is much more than the strike price of the bond, I will exercise the call option. When will a market price be more than the strike price? When the interest rates are much lower because prices and interest rates follow opposite direction. If the market price is higher than the strike price means market interest rate is lower than the strike interest rate. So, which means when the market interest rates are going down and down and down in the market, I will think of calling back the bond. Why even look at it from a logic standpoint without call option logic. If, let's say, I have initially issued the bonds at 10% interest, which means every year I have to pay an interest of 10% to all my lenders. Now, let's say the market interest rates have gone down to 6%. If I buy back all the bonds, I can very well reissue the bonds. I can raise new bonds at just 6% interest in the market. So at least for the next few years, I just need to pay 6% rather than 10% which I am paying today. That is the biggest motivation to call back the bond. When the interest rates in the market, so that's where probably even if you have observed in the Indian market, Probably 2010-11 time frame when the interest rates have touched the peak. Every bond that was issued in the market at that point or probably some of the bonds even in the current scenarios also. Every bond that was issued in the market at that point in time, it had a callable provision. 
because they are sure that within 5 years or something the interest rates will be much lower than whatever was the prevailing rate at which they have raised the capital. So, they want to have that kind of a provision of calling back the bond, probably reissuing it. If you look at the prospectus of any of the Indian bonds that got issued during the 2010-11 time frame, there was a callability feature that was associated in the bond. But probably when you look at the bonds which are issued or which will be issued, once the interest rates go very much low, none of the bonds will have a callable provision on them. Because the option, I mean the, the interest rate at which they are issuing the bond is much much cheaper. Probably the interest rates, if they, do, if they are sure that the interest rates will not fall even more further, for them the callable bond will be costly because they have to pay a premium to the other party for taking the call option. If the interest rates itself are very much low and they don't expect they will fall even more further, there is no point in issuing a callable provision to the bond at all. So generally what you will see is the callable provisions will be present in the bonds when the interest rates are very high because there is a very good chance that if the interest rates fall, the company will call back the bond. Now, the call option is at the discretion of, I mean the calling back the bond is at the discretion of the company or the borrower not the lender. So, obviously the borrower will exercise it only when it is beneficial to the borrower. So, which means the lender is at a risk because of this call option provision. Lender is at a risk and that is where we say because the lender is taking more risk in case of callable bond, the return also should be higher for a callable bond compared to a non-callable bond. If a non-callable bond is giving me 8% return, callable bond the same, with all features remaining the same, the callable bond should giving me should give me at least 9.5 or 10% return. That is where probably again going back to that same 2010-11 scenario, on one single newspaper on one single day, I have seen two different ads of again one a gold loan company and someone else where one was issuing the bond at 12.25% interest, the other was issuing the bond at around 10% interest, 10, 10.5% interest, right and people were very much attracted towards that 12.5% bond. Because all else have remained the same. Only the word is different. This is non-callable. This is callable. Ratings more or less the same. Nothing is different in both the scenarios. This is callable. This is non-callable. But in reality, if I see, both of them may have been more or less equal. Assuming the interest rates are going to fall within the next five years and the company may call back the bond which means they will call back only when the interest rates are much lower and if at that time I get the money even if I invest it at that point I will never get 10% that is the kind of interest rates that will come into the market after a certain point in time. So just the word of callability versus non-callability can create a difference of 2% easily right uh, so that is what we are saying. So, the, because there is a high risk in case of callability, because at least in non-callable, if it is a 10-year maturity bond, all 10 years the company has to pay me the same interest rate. But if there is a callability provision, in the middle they can call back and reissue it at a lesser interest rate. So, overall my benefit is much, much, might go much, much lesser also. That is one thing that has to be looked at. Because if the company wants it is exercise, not at the not at the investor's discretion, but it is more at the company's discretion, right? So, general, general exercise strategy is always when the interest rates are falling, so that they can reissue at a lower interest rate and reduce the overall cost of the borrowing. And in this, we have to very well check out whether there is some kind of a make-whole call provision, which is generally not used by any of the companies. 
but if it is there i am still fine with going for a callable bot what it says is if you are calling back in the middle whatever is the future benefits that are yet to come let's say i am calling back the bond after 5 years 6 7 8 9 10 years whatever the coupons and principal that have to be paid you find out the present value of all of them and pay that much amount not what you have decided in the beginning see let's say in the indenture it will be mentioned typically there are two ways of mentioning the call back in the indenture okay after 5 years if the company wants it can call back the bonds by paying you 1% more above the face value probably instead of face value of 100 we'll pay you 101 per bond and we'll call back the bonds because it is mentioned in the indenture at the beginning of the issuance of the bond itself the person has to be careful about that if he wants to buy it he will buy it otherwise he will not invest in those bonds at all but when there is a make whole call provision what it says is whenever the company is buying back the bond it does not buy back at 101 it buys back at the present value of all the future payments that are still outstanding it may come to 102 103 or 95 whatever it is it will buy back the bonds at that price right in that case my loss is not that big because i am getting compensated for whatever the interest that is going to go low in future because today i am getting a higher price than the face value i am compensated with that excess that is what is called as a make whole call provision which is the net present value of all the future payments that need to be made and it's like a compensation generally that's the reason no company will mention a make whole call provision as a part of its indenture it will only mention a call provision at a specific rate only those companies which want to reduce their liability drastically not reissuing the bond at a lesser rate see just like i was talking of uh, the normal borrower i want to get rid of my liability as soon as possible not that uh, i don't have any other investment opportunities or something right i want to get rid and uh, i want to free myself from any form of debt those kind of companies they don't mind taking a slight slight excess payment also because they want to get rid of the uh, uh, loan altogether because of some reason or the other there are so many reasons why companies may want to get rid of the loan but definitely not for reissuing it at a cheaper rate right so those kind of companies may typically uh, think of make whole call 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 kind of provision otherwise you will typically see the most of the time you will typically see a fixed price call where i can uh, or they may give two three different prices okay if we call back after 5 years we'll pay 1% more if we call back after 7 uh, years we'll pay half a percent more but any time after 7 years we call back we'll pay at par we'll pay only 100 and call back If you want, you purchase the bond because everything is mentioned in the prospectus or indenture very clearly. So only people who are interested in, who are fine with the indenture, only they can go and invest in that bond. Then the next provision that can come out is a sinking fund. This is slightly better compared to callable. Sinking fund is instead of pre, instead of buying back the bond at a specific point in time or something what the company thinks is okay we we have uh, let's say the the capital the the loan which we have raised is uh, 100000 or probably uh, 10 crores 100 million right we have raised a capital of 100 million what will is they have to pay interest on those 100 million for all the 10 years what they may think of is okay we'll keep paying interest but at the same time 
will retire 10% of the bonds every year. Which means 10% of the principal will pay back after first year. So we will be left only with 90, uh, 90 million at the end of first year. Then another 10 million in the second. Apart from the interest that you are paying, some principal payment also you do. But it's not an EMI exactly. Because uh, the princip in the initial years, the interest is much high. But the principal, you are making equal payments. Right? In some proportion, you will decide your principal repayment. But you are retiring some of the bonds every year instead of paying all 100 million after 10 years, the principal repayment. You are thinking of paying 10 million as a principal for 10 years. Here, you are not thinking of whether the interest rates are low in the market or high in the market. Right? You, have, you want to just pay off 10 million every year. So, sometimes for some of the investors where the interest rates are higher, at the, uh, let's say at the end of first year, the interest rates are higher. Those investors who got back their money, they are very happy because they can lend it at a higher rate now. But if the interest rates are going lower in the market, those investors are not happy. So, at least sinking fund may benefit some of the investors because it's not based on a specific pattern. It's not based on only when the interest rates are going low, the company will exercise it. Otherwise, it will not exercise. It will exercise in all the years whether the interest rates are up or down. If the sinking fund provision is there as a part of the as a part of uh, the, the indenture, it will be exercised. But even in addition to that uh, sinking fund option, they can also sinking fund provision, they can also go for accelerated sinking fund option. This is an option. On the top of sinking fund provision, they can have an accelerated sinking fund option. What does this mean? Okay, if the company wants, they can retire 20% every year or this year. That portion, 10% is mandatory because they have mentioned it as a part of the normal sinking fund provision. But this accelerated sinking fund provision is bringing out, if the company wants, it can pay 20%. It can buy back 20% this year. So only for that much portion, because it's a discretion of the company, they will exercise that accelerated part when the interest rates are typically going down. So to that extent, it can, if that option is there, mentioned as a part of the indenture, that will, that portion of it will benefit the company. Or they could even go for a tender offer. Tender offer is more to do with, I, I directly make an offer to the investor whenever I want because it's initially it's not mentioned in the prospectus. In the indenture, nothing, no call provision is there, no sinking fund provision is there. Now what I will do on a on an ad hoc basis if I have to do, I can make a tender offer to my investor or to my, so the same thing happens in case of stocks also. Right, if at all I want to buy back some of the shares, I will make a tender offer to some of my investors. Tender offer is nothing but, okay, if anyone who wants to surrender their shares or bonds, please surrender, I will pay you 2% more. Some premium I will pay you. If you want, you surrender. So, whosoever surrenders them, I will retire those much portion of the bond. So, that is what is the scenario of tender offer. But, uh, see, generally in case of shares, the acquisitions happen through tender offers and even uh, the acquisition stopping happens through tender offer. If, uh, if the acquiring company acquires the share, shares of all the shareholders through a tender offer, probably they will become the majority shareholder and a takeover will happen. Whereas if the parent company only buys back the shares using a tender offer, the stake of the promoters is going up in the company, which will actually prevent a takeover transaction. So this kind of tender offer purchase of shares will, one thing, it will attract some of the investors. 
okay if these guys are giving me 5% extra compared to the current market price why not sell off i'll get 5% profit extra within no time so those kind of investors what they do is they'll sell back their shares or sell back their bonds so because of that the the, the party who is buying them they can typically increase their stake this was typically the mechanism in which air, uh, kingfisher has acquired air tucker completely the same process right uh, a tender offer vijay malya has floated a tender offer for uh, the shares of air deccan being a premium over the market price so a lot of people surrendered their shares he has purchased the shares increased the stake crossed the air deccan promoter stake which is what had made him uh, take over the company altogether so if the same thing if the promoters of air deccan had done that their stake would have gone up and the takeover would have got avoided altogether so sometimes what happens is these takeovers are tender offers they may be hostile or they may be friendly also right probably in case of friendly there may not be a much bigger bidding or much bigger benefit to the party but if they go more and more hostile in any case i want to buy back then more and more premium will come into the market so that's where what uh, typically with respect to stocks at least any company which is acquiring more than 5% of the stake with respect to shares it has to inform sec about it same way if, if through tender offer any kind of uh, purchases are happening which constitute a significant portion on the market the 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 regulatory bodies have to be informed about these kind of transactions otherwise it will create a kind of imbalance in the trading process and when we are talking about uh, risk involved with the loans or bonds the two major risk which we perceive is from a credit risk standpoint there is a default and there is a credit spread default is more to do with the other party not paying either the principal or the interest or both on time again on time is also there when the due date is 1st july even if it is paid on 2nd july it is treated as some chance of a default itself right probably the margins are very very the, the probabilities will go much much lower but potential not to pay on a particular day that is the default risk the second risk that may come up is credit spread especially let's say a uh, a uh, treasury bond is giving a 5% return whereas our corporate bond is giving 8% return so the spread is 3% right typically there are two three ways of measuring the spread but in a very simple way this is called as the nominal spread the 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 simple way is what the return which the corporate bond is giving minus the return which the equivalent treasury bond is giving we are calling it as a spread now probably let's say if the economic situation in the country has gone worse right what could very well happen is lot of people show more and more interest towards government bonds right more demand comes for government bond because they don't want to take even that much amount of risk so more demand comes up for government bonds whereas less demand comes up for the corporate bond in case the economy is in a recession phase or contraction kind of a phase because of that what happens the gap between the 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 treasury bond versus a corporate bond the interest rate will actually widen up more demand here less demand here the gap actually widens up once the gap is widening up there is a very good uh, possibility of the price actually coming down because the, if the interest rates are gaps are widening the arbitrage opportunity is getting created more which could very well result in 
the price of those kind of bonds corporate bonds actually going low in the market so even without default also the prices of them are going down in the market so what will typically happen lot of people will try to sell them off before the prices actually go down so because of uh, more and more frequent selling the prices are even more going down in the market which means the value of the bond is coming drastically down which means the investors are typically losing investors who so ever have purchased that bond because their market prices have gone down drastically because of the widening of the spread they are losing out in a big way that kind of a risk that is coming up is more associated with the credit spread kind of a risk and even uh, typically we also talk about downgrading risk right basically if the credit ratings are changed even that will create an impact on the investor because uh, the moment uh, you are seeing when you have purchased the bond the bond was having a triple a rating but today the bond is having a, a double a rating or a rating that means automatically its uh, interest rates uh, have to go up right as per its risk its interest rate should be higher whereas it is actually giving you a lesser interest rate so obviously immediately the market price of that bond will come down because it is paying you a lesser coupon whereas the as per the market or as per its risk profile it has to pay you a higher coupon so because it is paying you a lesser interest than what it is supposed to pay for its for its risk the demand for that bond will typically go down which means the price will directly come down for that bond which means the investors of that bond are losing out so these are the three typical kind of uh, risks which from a credit standpoint the investor will be facing either it could be associated with the default or spread or even the rating downgrade and we also talk about uh, in case of bonds there could be a event risk one specific event occurring in a company could make the company default on its bonds that part we associate to the event risk probably some merger happening probably a huge cash has been paid to acquire some other company company is falling short of cash and let's say that part is not mentioned in the indenture and people have purchased it see sometimes it will be mentioned in the indenture that the company cannot take cannot get into takeovers until our bond is completely paid off until our loan is completely paid off that kind of things also will be there in the indenture or probably from a company side it will say we will not get into any kind of uh, further Uh, any kind of uh, further mergers or acquisitions until the bond is cleared these kind of statements will be there typically as a part of the indenture assume they are not there right and the company has taken over some other company at a very huge cash cash shortage lot of things happening because of which there is a good chance of default now or sometimes natural calamities can can create a huge default kind of scenario all these things are categorized as event risk and that will create a very huge fluctuation in the portfolio values so people have to be very much vigilant at the time of specific events could be natural or could be corporate related uh, events where there is a huge chance of fluctuations and which can one single event can result in default or Uh, or uh, spread risk or any of these things occurring so there should be a lot of vigilance uh, going behind this so that's where indenture generally people will play around the loopholes what are not mentioned in the indenture so that's where indenture becomes a key it's like a, almost a kind of a promissory document kind of stuff if something is not mentioned in the indenture nothing can be done about it because people have accepted that indenture and they have invested the money accordingly right and in the bonds we see another category which is a high yield bonds or typically uh, the market also calls them as junk bonds which are more of rating double b and below now they are 
generally issued by growing companies because and startups probably startups and growing kind of firms are established firms which have already have a lot of debt right i mean when we say senior debt it is like less risky debt they have taken so many loans which are less risky now any new loan they are going to take because they have already exceeded a specific limit on loans any new loan they have to take they have to take a risky loan only right not every borrowing can come for lesser risk for cheaper rate the moment uh, the company has already borrowed 1000 million if it has to borrow another 500 million probably it may not get at that same rate which it has got the earlier 1000 million so it is it has to issue it at a slightly higher rate of return which means if it is so high we call it as a high yield kind of a bond so typically uh, we see either startups will issue it or those companies even the even if it is an established company but if it is raising a huge capital or if it already has raised a huge loan and it is raising one more loan in those cases the bonds which are issued will have a very poor credit rating and those kind of credit rated bonds are what we are calling as high yield bonds or junk bonds sometimes they can be issued by fallen angels also fallen angel is some kind of a company which has got a very good credit rating some time back but today its credit rating has gone down drastically probably like a kingfisher few years back their credit ratings might have been much much better right but now their credit ratings are much much worse now today if they have to raise a capital for restructuring their company in the form of debt not as some other equity investor but if they want to raise it in the form of debt one no investor will come forward so if at all they have to entice the investor they have to give a very high return only then the investor will show an any kind of an interest in buying their bond which means the bonds which they are issuing are a junk bond or a high yield kind of bond because they will get definitely get a credit rating of much much lesser right now typically what you see in these kind of uh, in these kind of bonds is the coupon will be deferred see the structuring will happen in such a way that initial few periods company wants to preserve the cash see if i want to if i have to pay interest in the first year itself probably a startup raise the capital right generally it will take few years for that startup company to establish and generate revenue so what they do is they structure these kind of bonds in such a way that either they make it deferred interest means at least in the first few years no coupon zero coupon and probably from the fourth fifth sixth years they may start paying some kind of coupon so at least they are preserving the cash flow in the initial few years that is one thing which they may do or they may get into a step up bond that the structuring is more like a step up which means probably yeah the coupon which they are going to pay every year okay first 3 years 2% after that 3% after that few years 4% after that we will make it 6% 8% so probably they are stepping up the coupon every period that could be a structuring which they can do the most uh, better thing is pik bonds payment in kind kind of bond wherein instead of paying any interest for that worth of interest they will issue extra bond so it's as good as a zero coupon bond right whatever is the worth of the interest instead of paying the interest they are paying as an additional bond those are called as payment in kind kind of bond where there is also cash flow that is maintained it's only like they are borrowing heavily i mean even the interest is what they are borrowing those kind of which means at least for the first few years they can preserve the capital altogether cash flows can be preserved which can contribute to the growth of the company much faster see if they use that money again to pay the interest itself where is that they contribute to the growth of the company so they will try to use all kinds of mechanism 
where the cash flow can be preserved, sizable cash flow is preserved in the initial year so that it contributes to the growth of the company in a significant manner. Right? So, wherever there is a loss, we always talk about a word called recovery. Whenever we are talking about a loss on a bond or a loan, we always talk about the recovery. Basically, it's like how much I can recover. Not in, there is no scenario where it will be zero. Unless probably even in case of Kingfisher scenario, if a bank has to recover from Kingfisher, there are so many assets of Kingfisher which are there. So the bank can sell off those assets and it can recover some money. But how much? That is what is the recovery rate. Right, if the if the recovery rate, okay, 90%, 95%, so they are losing only to that extent of 5% or 10%. So that is what is mentioned by the recovery rate. To what extent I can get back? Probably a debenture investor, the recovery rate could be only 40% or 50%. But for a senior debt, senior debt investor, Almost 100% could be the recovery rate. So, even if the company defaults, those kind of lenders may not have a big problem at all. They can get back. They can sell off the assets of the company and they can recover the amount which is extent to the extent of their debt. Right? So, that's where more and more seniority, the recovery rates will be much, much higher. Whereas, for some, especially debentures or even equity investors, Equity investors we can forget about because they have to be mentally prepared that they will not get anything also. But even if I am talking of a debenture investor, his recovery rates could be much, much lesser. Right? 